which was uh, a great era for the game show. I miss the, the game show era. It was, it was what was on TV at the time, and um, one of the game shows that I remember happens to be the second longest running game show on ABC from 1966 to 2013. It was the newlywed game. You ever oh. seen that? <laughs> newlywed game, yeah. And they would, they would kind of give these questions and they would have you answer them as if your spouse, so uh, complete the sentence. I wish my spouse would stop and then you have to fill in the blank and see if you match. Um, I'm pretty sure Christina would write, pick up his, or putting his clothes on the ground. Um, there's, there's my question. Um, if my husband were to go on a trip, he'd want to go to blank. You'd see if they get the answer right. Um, what dish is your spouse's favorite? And it, it, was a, it was a silly game. And it was funny to watch these couples take the most important person in their life and see if they actually knew how they would answer questions. And, and it was a question about, do we know that person's will? Uh, today we're looking at uh, the Lord's Prayer, and we're looking at the part that Jonathan pointed out, which is, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And it sometimes feels like that, a little bit of a guessing game. How do we even know God's will? How do we guess it uh, in a way? And are we guessing it right? Uh, Let your will be done builds on last week's request, which was thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come was, God, have your way in this world. Have your way in this earth. But, but thy will be done makes it a little more personal. Uh, are we choosing what God would want for us? on a daily basis in the way that we live, in the way that we play, in the way that we move, in the way that we relate with each other. Um, and I think we get better and better at it over time. I remember one of my first, I don't even know if it was a date, uh, but my first time I got to spend with Christina was going to a Matchbox 20 concert mm -hmm. out of the gorge. And we got there really early and it gave me like three hours to sit there in the sun and just get cooked before the uh, <laughs> concert started. But I was, I was getting cooked with this person who I really, really wanted to get to know. And I didn't know much about her at the time. Um, just the other day we were walking the dog and, and it was rainy and it was gray. And we got to this one spot where we could see Lake Washington and she said, let's stop and just look at the lake. And I know that she loves nature. I know it like resets her stress level. It's very important. Um, and so we stopped. And then I kind of was sitting there, and I get bored after we stop for about two seconds because my ADD kicks in. And I go, doesn't the rain or the gray or the haziness of all this take something away from the view? Christine said, "No, not at all." And I go, "Huh? I didn't know that about you. Twenty years. I'm still finding out things." So. Hopefully over the next 20 years, I'll learn some more things, and hopefully as we walk with God further and further, we'll get to know things about Him and the way that He feels about things. Um, this question of, of what is God's will in our prayer, your will be done, um, it brings us back to the very first step of being a Christian. Next week, we're going to have some new members joining us, in, and we always ask the important first questions of being a Christian, and it is... Do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Accepting Jesus as a Savior is remembering what he has done for us on the cross, how he paid for our sins, and now he invites us into a new relationship with God. And then accepting him as our Lord is to say, Lord, we're putting you in charge instead of me. No longer my will, let your will be done. But that's only the beginning. And people define God's will in a lot of different ways. I'm pretty sure that the guy down at the Seahawks Stadium when I go down there, the guy with the giant poster board sign saying, turn, run from hell, and yelling into a bullhorn, I'm pretty sure he would tell me that that is God's will for him to be doing. I would disagree. Um, so how do we figure it out? How do we get God's will? And then especially when it gets to be the questions that actually matter to our lives, um, in the moments that we need those questions answered. Like, we have dilemmas. We go, should I take this job or that? Should I retire now or, or later? Um, what do we hope for? Should I, should I enter into this relationship with a harsh word or with a kind word? That's, that's been one I've been trying to figure out a lot with my niece lately. Um, and what I do is I pray, and then I hope that God gives me a neon sign, a vision, or a dream. Or at least makes it abundantly clear beyond a shadow of a doubt what it is that I'm supposed to do. Um, on occasion that works. 
I don't have a neon sign yet, but I have, I have had a strong sense of what I'm to do. I have had circumstances, I think, tell me exactly what to do. But, but if I'm completely honest, a lot of time I'm left with my gut. And my gut isn't always right, and I would be very, very, very cautious to say my gut is definitely God's will at all times, because I think uh, that would be a little bit of an overstep. Usually I recognize God's will in hindsight. Hindsight's twenty twenty, and um, sometimes once something has happened, you can go, oh, that was God's will. I remember chatting with a pastor or a friend of mine, and we were talking about, is there one person out there for each person? The soulmate question. And, uh, and I said, was it God's will that I marry Christina on this particular day at this particular time? And he said, uh, I don't know. But I know that you married her. It's definitely God's will. <laughs> and it reminded me, hindsight is really, really easy. But how do we do it moving forward? How do I figure out God's will now? Um, it's almost like we shoot God emails. And go, God, I need to know an answer in the next two days about this thing. Could you let me know? And we don't usually get an answer. Um, we're kind of left wondering. And why is this so difficult? I, and I don't think it's uh, that that's God's trying to be secretive or leading us to our own devices. Um, but it's not how God communicates as well. He doesn't shoot emails back. I wish he did. It would be so much easier. Um, <laughs> But that's not how it works most of the time. And so um, I was thinking about how does God communicate as well? And, and he does it by, in the, in the Gospels, he does it by inviting people to come with him, to walk with him, and to see the things that he says, and to see the things that he does, and to be a part of the stuff that he's doing. Um, and then even after he uh, had gone into heaven, he sent his spirit to do the same. Keep walking with me. You'll figure out my will. I'll teach it to you. Um, it's sort of on-the-job relational training. And um, I rarely sit down with Christina and say, I have 25 questions for you that I have to know about how you would answer these so that I can uh, make decisions for our marriage or whatnot. Um, usually, it's sort of, as I spend time with her, I'm getting to know how she might answer stuff. And I'd like to say that I'm getting much better at it. Uh, we'll see. Um, but most of the time when the Bible talks about our relationship with God, it does it in relational terms. What was the first part of the Lord's Prayer? Mm -hmm. Our Father, who art in heaven. The one who loves us and cares for us. Um, when you look at the story of the lost sheep, the, the sheep might be willful, stubborn, and go a different direction. But it's, it's the shepherd who chases it down and brings it back. Um, the sheep get to know the voice of the shepherd the more time they have with them. And that's what they respond to. That's what they do. Um, I was at a dog training class, and there was this lady who had two giant dogs. And this happens regularly. They, they go to dog training because they bought dogs that are too big for them. So the dog is pulling them around. Um, this lady had two of them. And Christina and I had little Gabby, who's about 40 pounds. We could manage. And so I offered to take the dog for one of the dogs for her and run it through this routine that the dog trainer was having us do. And um, it wasn't that the dog was disobedient. It was that the dog didn't know me. And so it created a little bit of havoc because I would say stuff to the dog and the dog wouldn't do it. But then all the way across the little park, if the owner said, sit, the dog would suddenly like flop down. That's my owner. That's, that's the one I'm in relationship with. I know that voice and I know that person's will. Um, God's will is not a little thread that we have to follow that if we get it wrong, we're going to fall out of his will. It's not a corporate HQ policy with a manual that you can just read the manual and you'll have your answers all the time. It's a relationship. Um, so how do we know God's will? Back to the original question. If it's a relationship. And I don't think it's near as confusing as we make it out to be. Um, how do you get to know someone? This is an honest question. You guys can feel free to answer. I'm not going to just ramble. Uh, how do you get to know someone? Yeah, John. Spend time. Spend time with them? Yeah. Ask, ask, ask them questions. Get curious about them. Yeah. Ask other people about them. Ooh, ask other people about them. <laughs> <laughs> do some work with them. 
Yeah, do stuff with them. I have tried to sit down with guys for years asking them questions, and I'm kind of built relationally like that. But you get to know someone when you do something with them. Go do a project with them. Watch how they treat other people. That's one I was giving my niece lately. She's trying to figure out next steps for her boyfriend. Watch how he treats the waiters and waitresses, things like that. Uh, you'll find out a little bit more about his character. Um, how I wouldn't suggest doing it. Uh, speed dating. Everyone remember that was a little trend? <laughs> Bizarre. Bizarre. You sit down at a table, you're given two minutes to ask as many questions as you possibly can to get as much information as possible, and hopefully before that two minutes you decide to exchange phone numbers so that you can start a relationship. Weird. <laughs> That's a weird way to get to know somebody. It's, it's awfully weird. Um, <laughs> dating sites. There's a profile there, but it's kind of what they have wanted to say about themselves. It may not be the real scoop. It might be. Um, I was talking to a buddy of mine, buddy of mine who does uh, doing <laughs> online dating, and he said one of the most frustrating things is that uh, when people get together, they don't talk about themselves. All they do is ask questions about you. And so there's not an actual getting to know that happens. Uh, so I was thinking, how do I get to know people? I think one of my favorite ways to get to know somebody is to see their house. When you walk into someone's house, uh, you get to a sense of kind of who they are. What's, what's up on the fridge? Who are the pictures in there? Uh, what books do they have on their shelves? Um, and I've had the joy of being in a number of your houses, and uh, they reflect you. I know on, in my house, right above the sink, in prominent view, is something that says, good coffee is a pleasure, but good friends are a treasure. And it is a reflection of Christina and I. Uh, we value people even more than we value coffee, which is saying something. Um, <laughs> part of this, thy will be done, is on earth as it is in heaven. What's heaven going to be like? How are people treated in heaven? I know every person is, is beyond value. People are worth dying for, according to our Lord. Um, God doesn't seem to measure people by the stuff we do. Finances, social status, race, uh, orientation. Uh, every person is just as valuable as the next. And then there's these crazy stories Jesus told about the kingdom of God. Uh, prodigal son comes home after wasting everything. And the father loves him and is so glad he's here that he restores him. That's an interesting way to view people. Uh, a guy works for one hour and uh, another guy works for 12 hours. And they're both given a full day's wages. The, the Heaven is described as a banquet overflowing abundance. There's enough for everybody. The lion lies down with the lamb, so there's, there's peace between people. Um, every nation, tongue, and tribe. I want to read this, this passage, Revelation. Um, it's a beautiful picture. Revelation 7, starting in verse 9. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, and they were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell down on their faces before the throne, and they worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. <coughs> worship is the will of God, multi-ethnic, diverse worship. We're going to be surprised at what heaven looks like because God's house is a very peculiar one, and it doesn't fit the patterns that we've been showing a lot. When we see how heaven runs, how God's will is shown there, we can start to align our lives the same way. How do we treat people? And on what basis do we show people favor or not? Jonathan uh, brought up the idea of listening to people and, and talking with them. Um, psalm 119, it's the longest psalm in the Bible. Uh, I used to think I wanted to memorize it. it it's a long psalm. 
I gave up a little bit shortly thereafter. Uh, I'm going to read for you from verses 129 through 135. Uh, that's the dilemma for me. Um, your statutes are wonderful, therefore I obey them. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and I pant. I'm longing for your commands. Turn to me. Have mercy on me, as you always do those who love your name. Direct my footsteps according to your word. Let no sin rule over me. Redeem me from human oppression, that I might obey your precepts. Make your face shine on your servant. Teach me your decrees. Streams of tears flow from my eyes, for your law is not obeyed. The longest psalm in the Bible is dedicated to simply this. Hear what God has to say. It's good. It's good. It's good will is there. We have a trick that we sometimes assume uh, we already know. Especially us who have been around the church a while. We kind of get indoctrinated in a way. We, we grow up and we hear things. Um, and we hear what somebody has said up front. Or we hear what was said in the community that we grew up with. And we go, well, I already know that. God's word. Um, challenge it. Question it. When you're listening to me preach, I would love it if you were like, I don't know. i got to compare that to your word. God, what's God's word say? Because um, when we spend time listening to what he says, it will gradually shape us. Some of it's instant, right? Some of it's no-brainer stuff, like the Ten Commandments. Uh, they're pretty clear. Like, I don't have to wonder, is it okay to steal from somebody and then give it to the Lord? Would that be a way of furthering the kingdom of God? Well, it wouldn't be because it's pretty clear. Like, don't steal. That's, that's part of the deal. Um, adultery doesn't really fit in the kingdom of God. It doesn't further the kingdom of God. And, uh, but there are parts of our culture that don't match it. What about honor your husband or honor your parents? It's a weird commandment. Not necessarily what I'm saying. What about when your parents are jerks? Oof. Then it gets really hard to do that. But that's God's will. So it challenges us. But a lot of the stuff that we do um, is a little more fuzzy than that. It's harder to figure out God's will. Where do I volunteer? Or do I volunteer here or there? But the reality is as we get to know God, as we spend more time in His Word, as this gradual process of spending time with them happens, I think we get better at aligning ourselves and going, here's where the kingdom of God will move forward. So I'm going to volunteer over here. Um, I could either help the poor or I could um, save pets. Well, both are good ministries. Where would the kingdom of God move forward more? And I think we get better at discerning that as we figure out. Another way to get to know somebody besides just listening to them or going to their house is uh, exactly what Alyssa said. Let's do some stuff with them. Uh, Jesus loved being with his disciples. A ton of the ministry that happened was because they were walking around doing stuff. And, it, and a ton of what's in the Gospels is stories of Jesus doing things. Those stories set the groundwork for the disciples to be able to continue to do the stuff that Jesus invited them to do. Um, and they sort of got ingrained in them. It becomes a part of our DNA when we do something with somebody and we do it the same way all the time. Uh, Larry has, has gotten me into Proverbs every Wednesday for a very, very long time. It's now in my DNA to get proverbial every Wednesday morning. Um, <laughs> It's just what I do. Um, my dad was the consummate garage sale shopper. And um, I hated it. He would wake me up at like 6 a.m. on Saturday after a long week of school and go, it's time to go garage sailing. And he would pull out the newspaper. And it was my job to sit there and read the addresses of the things that he had circled at probably 5 a.m. So that we could drive around and we would come home with a carload of stuff, most of which we didn't want or need. But they were really good deals, darling. I discovered an app called OfferUp, which is a giant garage sale. I had to take it off my phone because there's this like DNA string in me that our house cannot handle if I engage it. Where I go, 
yeah, but it's only 10 bucks. <laughs> I could have that. And I remember one time my mom being just livid because my dad came home with a wood lathe. He was going to make our own bowls. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a good deal. <clears throat> We don't have a road wood like that at our house, so I had to take the app off my phone. But the knee-jerk reaction is to just do what I saw done, what I grew up around. Um, what if that's how we were with God because we spent enough time with Him? Our knee-jerk reaction to things was to do His will. As we invite Jesus to be with us, to move in our lives and to work, and as we consider what he would have us do, and as we invite him into the little moments and the big moments, um, we start to look a little bit more like him. I still think that the ultimate measure of a church or of a Christian is do they look like Jesus in the way that they relate with people. God rubs off on us. Jonathan uh, already shared this scripture, he stole my thunder, now it will be his dear my thunder. <laughs> We're reiterating some great thunder. Um, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve of what God's will is, and it's good, and it's pleasing, and it's perfect. Um, Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. It's not just sitting around listening. It's, it's doing things with God. And then we get to know it. And then Mrs. Murdy brought up uh, listening to what other people have to say about it. Ask his friends. Um, this week we went to a funeral which deeply affected Christina and I. Um, our our 35-year-old friend passed away. He had two daughters, one nine, one six. And I was thinking, for that nine-year-old, she'll have a sense of her doubt for a long time. For the six-year-old, it might be a little fuzzier. And I was talking to my mom about this. She lost her dad at eight. And um, for her, it's really hard to remember. And it was made harder because her mom decided that it was time to move on. And uh, just sort of like didn't want to talk about that. Just push that subject away. At this memorial, they had us do a little activity. They passed out cards to everybody, and they had us write our favorite story <clears throat> of this guy's life. Um, and we wrote down these stories, and I was thinking, how smart and how wise is that? Because that six-year-old would never know what her dad was like in Bible study with a bunch of other guys when he expressed his heart. But I could write that down. And at some point, she's going to read that and go... That's what that was. The more time we spend with each other, listening to how God is moving and what God is doing, and as we share stories where we've asked for God to, to do things, um, we start to get a sense of who God is. That's actually the Bible, by the way. Uh, a good chunk of the Bible is just an account of God walking with a bunch of people. I was talking to this lady once, and she was telling me um, that she had a very, very personal relationship with God. She didn't want to be a part of any organized religion, just, just a personal relationship with God. And the, and the trick about it that, um, that didn't feel right to me was not only was she not able to hear the other stories of what was going on with other people and how God was moving with them, but the church missed out on her stories. Um, and it was weaker because of it. An isolated perspective of God isn't a well-rounded one. We need to hear how you see God and how you see God and how God moves you. And it creates this rounded perspective where we can see it from all the different directions. <laughs> I want to close with, with this story. My niece, um, we had a breakthrough moment. It was a rare moment. She came to me and she actually asked me what she thought might be good steps for her to get to know her boyfriend better. I was like, this is shocking. An 18-year-old was asking for my input. I mean, that, that is a miracle in and of itself. Um, and I began to give her some suggestions. And I said, well, maybe moving in with him right now is not the best way to go about it. I uh, can think of some other options. Um, and we began to talk about it. 
And some of the stuff she wanted to hear, some of it she didn't want to hear, some of it um, she will ignore, and some of it she will do something with. But at the end of the day, what I was telling her wasn't because I wanted her to do what I wanted her to do. Um, it's because I care about her, and I love her, and I want her not to put herself in harm's way, and I want her to find the best life possible. Um, God invites us to pray, Thy will be done, not because he needs a bunch of people running around doing stuff for him. God's plenty capable of getting done what he wants to get done in this world, and he will. He says, seek my will, because it's the place that you're going to find good, pleasing, perfect, abundant life. If you want to be free, seek God's will. If you want to live life to the full, seek God's will. Thy will be done is the place where you're going to find it. Are we taking the steps that we need to take to be in relationship, to spend time with God enough that He can shape our lives? I think that's the question and the challenge that we <coughs> request of prayer. Let's pray. God, we need your help with this. Um, our will is awful strong. The world's pattern is awfully strong. But the best possible place for us is in your will. So Lord, help us to seek you. Help us to be people who reflect you more and more. Have your way in our lives. We invite you to be with us during these next uh, days and weeks and months and years. Guide us, shape us, and use us so that the world can see who you are and so that we can see who you are. We love you.